Welcome to the Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who try various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Tonight's guest is Marcia Montenegro, ex-professional astrologer. Marcia practiced spiritualism, Hinduism and Buddhism, as well as psychic development and astral travel. Like many New Agers, she spoke with a spirit guide. Marcia now speaks in churches and has written articles for journals and books such as The Kingdom of the Occult by Walter Martin. Hello, Marcia. Hello, Laura. It's good to speak with you. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful to speak with you. I'm so glad that we can connect across the ocean. Yes, it's <laughs> wonderful. And I'm glad we got the Skype working this time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could you start off, Marsha, by telling us a little of your family background and whether or not your family had any faith? Yes, um, I was um, in a family that moved a lot because my father was a diplomat in the Foreign Service. So I spent much of my childhood overseas, outside the United States. Um, my father was an agnostic and not interested in church. My mother was um, pretty much a nominal Southern Baptist, so she didn't really practice her faith, but she did think church was important for children, so my sister and I went to Sunday schools and churches, but in the countries where we were, it, it really varied and did not have much of an impact on me. When we came back to the United States, um, I got involved with a church near my home, uh, mainly because my mother more or less required it, and I was going to Sunday school and youth group and, and you know, doing the Sunday school lessons, and I considered myself a Christian because I was going to church, uh, but I really wasn't, I didn't really understand what it meant to be a Christian. I thought it was an outward thing where you were in church a lot, you know, that's pretty much, and that you had to be good to get to heaven. Yeah. And so when did you start to get interested in the supernatural? Did that happen quite early on? Uh, yes, actually, it really did happen early. Um, I was very interested in high school in astrology, and I was interested in um, other religions. I was interested in the powers of the mind, very especially that and astrology were two of my main interests. Um, when, I, when I was younger than that, when I was 11, I had a dream uh, uh, that was very strange that turned out to be a dream about a little boy I had known when I was very young who had died, and in the dream I couldn't find him. But at the time I had the dream, I didn't know he had died. So I, um, when I found out he had died, I connected that with the dream. I don't know that I thought about it as being supernatural, but I thought about it as being special information that, you know, came to me in some special way. Um, so the, the, the real serious interest began in high school, however. And so did you have other friends in high school that encouraged you to, to get into these things? Um, in high school, I didn't. I did have some friends in other religions that made me interested in looking outside Christianity. Uh, but the, the friends in, into the supernatural things were in college. 
Um, I had a friend who said she could see auras around people. This is uh, for people who don't know what that is. That's seeing these these colors around people that have a spiritual and personal significance for the person. And um, there was a, a woman there on campus who did tarot cards and several people um, interested in astrology. There, weren't a, there wasn't a, a strong interest in the supernatural among my friends. Some of them had no interest at all. But my interest continued. And with these um, few friends, knowing these people had have, have these kind of abilities or interest, it made me much more interested, you know, so it's just fueled my interest. Yes, so what type of things did you begin to do? Well, after college, I really, uh, when I had more time to look into these things, I did a lot of reading, and initially my reading was on um, contacting the dead, and I read some materials on that. I also was interested in Hinduism and reincarnation. And I was doing a a lot of reading on those areas. And as I was reading these, these materials, I began to accept the idea of reincarnation because it made a lot of sense to me. And I thought, well, that explains why You know, some people have these lives with all these terrible things happening and other people have these very, very successful lives because they um, either are sort of rewarded for things they did in previous lives or they they were able to uh, get their skills, you know, more sharpened so that this lifetime they're very, very talented. And then the other people were having... Um, bad things happen because they had done bad things in previous lives. So in a certain way, it made a lot of sense to me, and it was very intriguing. And then I was reading a book about uh, by a psychologist, uh, Ian Stevenson, at Harvard. He, I think he taught clinical psychology at Harvard, beginning to think that his patients were remembering previous lives and he wrote a whole book about 20 cases uh, that suggested reincarnation and that really convinced me yeah I can identify with that because I was basically the same at that age and you know explored the things you mentioned there and um, I also was interested in parapsychology um, where you know, the psychologists did did think that their patients had previous lives, so there certainly seemed to be a lot of evidence to to make it look accurate. Yes, I was interested in that too in high school. I I had heard of that, and actually my mother took a whole course on it um, at the University of Maryland. She was taking some courses there. She already had a college degree, but... I think she was thinking of getting a further degree um, in education. I I can't remember now, but she was taking, she took a course on parapsychology and told me about it, and I was very intrigued. My interest in that continued, you know, for many years. I never lost interest in that. Yeah. And so what was the next step then? Well, after reading all of these things and beginning to believe in it, um, and at the time also I think I I visited an astrologer and I saw a few psychics. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, I did Horton. In my um, junior year of college, a friend of mine um, who was in her senior year was doing a special project on spiritualism. Um, which for many people may not, they don't know what that is. It's actually the belief in contacting the dead. And I know you're very familiar with that, Laura. Um, And um, and it's an organized um, church, at least in the United States, and I think also in the UK. And um, there were several of these spiritualist churches in the city where our um, school was, 
and she, as part of her project, she had to visit these churches, and so she didn't want to go alone, so a group of us went with her, and what happened in these churches, of course, was where the ministers um, would come before the congregation and then claim they were receiving messages from uh, deceased people related to people in the congregation, and they would give these messages. Well, I was very, very intrigued by this, and um, in a few cases, after the meetings were over, the minister or some of the people there uh, closely associated with the church would come up to us and talk to us because they could tell that we were not regular, you know, attenders, (laughs) and we were obviously college students. And what happened is, is that in every case, one of them would come to me and give me a special message about the fact that I had gifts. You know, one of them told me how to develop psychic ability, and another one told me I was going to be working, you know, in the area of of psychic-type things. So I felt that I was sort of marked for something special, and even though I wasn't particularly interested in going into that uh, religious-type um, of, of community, I was intrigued by the whole idea of this supernatural contact, and that was a very important, had an, a big impact on me, and I forgot to mention it. So uh, all of these years after college, when I was investigating these things and my interest continued, I took a course called um, Inner Light Consciousness, which introduced me to Um, a particular form of meditation. And um, we also, uh, after a week of this, at the end of the course, in the last meditation, which was a guided meditation by the teacher, we were told we would meet our spiritual master and that our spiritual master would be with us our whole lives and that we could use the meditation to contact him or her, but eventually we wouldn't need the meditation to do that. We could just, we could just contact the spiritual master or the spiritual master might contact us. So I did do the meditation, of course, and encountered what was called my spiritual master. Um, And of course, this is a disembodied being. This is not a person in, in in a human body. It's disembodied. And um, he looked very kind and wise to me, and I felt his presence with me immediately. And from then on, while I was into, got into the New Age more deeply, I always felt him with me, and sometimes I would see him in my dreams. I didn't have as close an association as... Some people do, but these are spirit guides. Um, Just so your listeners understand what these are, the spirit guides are in the New Age and spiritualism and psychics and and anybody in those areas believes that these spirit guides are benevolent. And some of them think they're angels. Some of them think they're enlightened beings who have gone on to other dimensions and are there to guide certain people on earth in their spiritual journey, which is what I thought. And, um, of course, what the spirit guides are, are fallen angels. And um, taking on the guise of somebody who's benevolent and who will help you. Uh, So, but at the time, of course, I didn't believe that. And I just thought that he was benevolent. And after that point, I got more deeply involved in everything. I I got into Tibetan Buddhism. I learned how to do Tibetan Buddhist meditation and then into Zen Buddhism. And I was also, um, right around, shortly after that time, I started studying astrology in a serious way by taking um, astrology classes and also psychic development classes at a place in Atlanta, Georgia, called the Foundation of Truth. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you saying all that, Marsha, and it reminds me that many times I hear people say it's okay to do meditation 
and it's okay to do yoga um, because they're not, you know, trying to do any occult activities. Mm -hmm. However, I remember when I was a spiritualist that those who taught yoga and those who taught meditation would tell us these are great ways to get in contact with spirits. These are great ways to open yourself to spirits. Exactly, exactly. yes. The, so, so to get, get in touch, touch with the, the spirit, spirit guide. guide. Yeah, absolutely. So what what happened next in your story, Marsha? I um I actually took um a test. It's very, very unusual. Um, and as far as I know, there's only two cities in the United States that do this, but they have a test for astrology. And this is so that you can be qualified to um, get a business license. So in the city of Atlanta, in order to practice, I decided I really wanted to be an astrologer. I felt that that was my calling. Yeah. And in the city of Atlanta, it just so happens to be one of the two cities in the United States. And the other one's Las Vegas, and I don't really know how act how it works there. But you um, have to have a business license to practice legally in the city limits. And I was living in the city limits. And um, in order to get the business license, you had to take a test, either given by the American Federation of Astrologers or a test given by the Atlanta Board of Astrology Examiners, which was much easier to, to do because it was given right there in Atlanta, whereas the AFA exam is given in various cities across the country at different times of the year, so you usually have to travel. But if you take the Atlanta test, of course, it's right there. So you go to City Hall, and you take a seven-hour exam. And, um, yeah, a lot of... A lot of people are surprised when they hear that, but you have to know how to compute the chart by hand. You can't use anything to help you. You have to do it all by hand. So you have to know the formulas. And then um, they give you another chart and ask you to write an interpretation of the chart out as if you're talking to the person whose chart it is. So you have to pretend you're talking to the person to write it out. So this is why it's seven hours long, and I used every minute of the seven hours. And um, I did pass, and I, I purchased my license, and I was practicing, you know, was getting clients gradually, and it increased, you know, very rapidly, actually. And I was also um, active in the Astrological Society, and at the same time, continued interest in things like um, someone gave me some tarot cards. So I started reading about tarot cards. I had also taken a little numerology, and I'd had the psychic development classes. So I still had interest in all those areas, although I was very much focused on astrology. And I was still doing also the Buddhist meditation pretty much every day. So my whole life was centered in those areas, and most of my friends either um, were practitioners, um, like they were astrologers or psychics or tarot card readers, and um, I also knew some spiritualists, or they were just New Agers into some of the Eastern gurus and Eastern teachings, or they were Wiccans, um, and I had a number of Wiccan um, and which clients and friends, and I was their astrologer. So that was pretty much my, my community of people, and my, my beliefs were that God was an energy or a force, and that we all came from God, and we would all eventually, when we were more enlightened after many, many lives, we would go back to God, and I believed that Jesus was an enlightened teacher like uh, Buddha. He was like Buddha or Krishna. He was an advanced um, spiritual being who had ushered in the age of Pisces uh, to prepare us for the coming age of Aquarius. And so that was my view of, of God and Jesus. 
that was the exact same as, as myself, Marsha. <laughs> um, I thought that too. And um, I remember being extra excited because at the time my star sign that I obviously believed in it then was Aquarius. So I thought I was, you know, really quite... <laughs> <laughs> really quite special to, to be coming into the age of Aquarius and having the Aquarian star sign, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course my mother my mother was um she believed she was the the, the star sign of, of Pisces. So um, um we both thought that was quite quite cool. So Marsha, yes. could you tell us during this time did anything frightening happen? to you any any kind of a supernatural frightening experience at the, uh, yeah i did have some uh frightening experiences uh when there were the out of body experiences which i didn't seem to have much control over and um these actually had begun um, many years earlier, like they began, well, I had the first incident was actually in college in the middle of the day on a very sunny afternoon, and I didn't know what it was. I actually thought I had died, um, and it was very short, but, and I didn't tell anybody about it, and so a few years later, I realized um, in reading all the um, occult, occult books I was reading, that it was um, out of body or astral travel experience. Well, at that point, they started happening around that time more frequently, and they were usually, um, you know, they they were kind of not really good or not bad. But sometimes they were they were frightening because I didn't know where I was, um, and I didn't know the the landscape that I was in was very bizarre and. I didn't understand what it meant. I did have one very strange, this wasn't so much astral travel as just um, an out-of-body thing where I was hovering over my body and I could see I was looking down at my body in the bed and then I could look across and I saw myself in another form. I saw myself in a white robe across from me. So there was like three of me because there was me where I was looking at my body and then also looking at this third thing that was like an apparition and I didn't know what that meant they had it and they told me what they thought it meant I think they told me that, that of course the body on the bed was just my body and that what I was looking at was my higher self or something in the white robe and um uh, the other, the other, that wasn't so frightening as it was confusing, but I had a very, very frightening out-of-body experience where I was in the room, but I was over in the corner of the room looking at the bed, and there was a very, very, very tall figure at the bottom of my bed looking down at the bed, at my body, and this tall figure was completely in black, and had a hood. It was in a hooded robe, and I couldn't see. I couldn't see the face, and I saw it looking at my body, and I immediately thought something was going to happen to me. And I went back in my body, and as I did so, I could see it at the bottom of the bed for a few seconds, and then it and then it disappeared. But I was very frightened because that figure was extremely scary, and I didn't know who it was <laughs> yeah yeah I, I do remember m my mother when when she practiced the things you have mentioned she also had experiences like that and one of the things she found most frightening was just the sheer lack of control she just couldn't control what would happen to her mm -hmm. uh, was that a different time from I read your blog where it said you saw a spirit at the foot of your bed and it said it was here to take over your body was that a different experience yes and that happened much much later the one with the tall figure was even before I started um, taking the astrology classes and it was before the tipper like consciousness class it happened about 
uh, maybe a year or two before that. The other one happened about two years before I became a Christian. So it was it was several years later, about um, let's see, about four, uh, maybe thirteen years later. And um, uh, yes, there was a, a figure of an old woman sitting at the bottom of my bed, looking at me very intensely. And she didn't speak, but I could hear her in my mind. She was saying, I'm here to take possession of your body. And it was, I, I have to tell you, that was the most frightening thing. That was even more frightening than the tall figure that I saw, because this was the idea of something taking over my body. And I was so scared, I really almost thought I was going to die from fear. And in, so in my mind, I was saying, no, you, you, you can't. No, you can't have my body. And she was saying, yes, I will. I am here to take your body. And it was like this battle that went back and forth. And, of course, I didn't know, I didn't know God, so I, I didn't pray. You know, the idea of praying never came to me. But I was just fighting with my mind. And after what seemed to be a long time, I don't think it was, but it seemed like it. She finally just, fa- she finally faded away. And I was lying there covered in perspiration. My heart was beating, it's, you know, beating like 150 beats a minute or something. Um, and I thought that I really just was so, so afraid I couldn't even move for several minutes. I couldn't move. I, that's the most frightening thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. And, you know, I hear accounts like that all the time from people who who were exploring these things, including myself and my mother. At one time, that happened to my mother, and um, she was still a medium, but she called out on the name of Jesus Christ, and the apparition vanished. Yes. Which was really wonderful. Um, Yes, yes. I have heard people with stories like that, and I think that... In my case, God just, out of his mercy, protected me yeah. uh, because I didn't call on Jesus or, or, or God or anything, but just because he's a merciful God, um, he just protected me from whatever, you know, was happening there, which I, I, I totally believe that was a demonic presence, and I think that God just protected me. Absolutely. And during, during times when frightening things happened did you ever wonder if perhaps Christians were right after all and that these spirits were actually demonic as described in the Bible no I never never thought thought that that. (laughs) I I never never, that's that's the one one thing thing about me even though these scary things happened um I, I would always explain them away. I would, ex- I would tell myself I was being tested. Um, or I would tell myself that I wasn't ready yet to go on to a more peaceful type experience. And I needed more spiritual, you know, growth. And I needed to work more on my spiritual path. And I think that I was able to justify these things to myself. I never thought Christians were right. I always thought they were wrong. I was very hostile to the whole idea of anybody thinking that you had to believe in Jesus as a Savior. And I I actually had a lot of contempt for that view. And I had a lot of contempt for Christians. So I never thought that. That's what's so amazing to me that I became a Christian because until God intervened in my life and I actually believed in him, I never thought the Christians were right. (laughs) I I was actually the same. I was the exact same. And um, it's strange now looking back on it because like, like yourself, I, I studied theosophy a little and I remembered that a lot of the top famous mediums would say Lucifer is God and Lucifer is the source of all psychic powers. And yet I never thought, hmm, maybe he's Satan after all. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the, the theosophical people are Luciferians, and they think he's, he's really the angel of um, wisdom. Yeah. 
Yeah, I never thought, I never believed during all of this, I never believed that Satan was real. Even though I'd heard about Satan, you know, in the years I had gone to church, um, I never believed in him. And even more so after being involved in these uh, things, I believed in him even less. Yeah. So tell us, Marshall, why was it you decided to begin to leave that lifestyle? What happened that made you begin to seek the truth about Jesus? Well, what happened is, is that, um, and this... I was very much, you know, satisfied with my life as an astrologer. In fact, I really loved it. Okay. What happened is, is that in the spring of 1990, um, I started getting a very strong compulsion to go to a church. And I didn't understand it because I really didn't want to go, but it, it was very strong and it wouldn't go away. And it continued through the summer and into the, um, you know, into August when I went to an astrological conference out in Oregon. It was the second time I had gone and done workshops at that conference. I came back and the compulsion was so strong, I thought, okay, I'll go to a church and just get it out of my system because it's probably something unfinished from a previous life <laughs> so <laughs> so that's how I talked myself into it <laughs> so I went to a very large church downtown where I was pretty sure no one would know me and I sat in the back of the church so I could leave early and that was my plan on the end of the pew in the back of the church and the service began and everyone stood up and they had a procession down the aisle, and at the head of the procession was a young uh, boy, you know, 13, 14, carrying a very large cross. It was an Episcopal church, and as he walked by me, I felt this powerful um, outpouring of love falling on me, from above. Uh, um, I call it a waterfall of love, and it was very, very real. It had nothing to do with the music or the people or the building or anything, and in fact, I knew it was coming from a personal God, but I didn't believe in a personal God, so yet I knew that it was a completely contradictory to my beliefs, and I, and I started... Um, I, you know, tears were coming out of my eyes because I had never felt that kind of love. And I stayed for the whole service. And then I went back um, the next Sunday, but I told myself I'm not changing anything in my life. And I will continue to do astrology. And in fact, in that church, some people asked for my business card because um, it was a very, very um, open-minded church. <laughs> and so uh, no one told me astrology was wrong, and I was somewhat comfortable. I didn't understand anything that was going on, but I kept going. And within a few weeks, I started getting an impression that God didn't like astrology. And this is not, here again, no one told me this. But I thought, this God doesn't like astrology. I wonder why not. Well, that quickly became an impression that God wanted me to give it up. And that was where, you know, I really resisted because I couldn't imagine not being an astrologer. I, at the same time now, I was very active at the Astrological Society. I took part in uh, astrology. In fact, I helped plan Astrology Awareness Day which we did twice a year for the public to promote astrology. And that was held around Halloween of, of, of 1990. And by the way, this initial visit to the church was on Labor Day, which is, was the first weekend in September. And so on, on Halloween, we were doing Astrology Awareness Day. And, I, um, and then this into November started thinking God didn't want me to give it up and it became so powerful I actually 
This is what still amazes me to this day. Without being a Christian, without even wanting to be a Christian, I gave it up. The night before Thanksgiving, which is the end, you know, it's the fourth here in the United States, the fourth Thursday of November. So the night before I gave it up, and um, there's a lot of strange things that happened. I probably don't have time to tell. Like I went to my, I went to Thanksgiving at my chiropractor's, and she she was a witch, and everyone there was a witch except me. <laughs> I had a very strange experience there, but I don't have time to tell it. So anyway, I had given it up. I had I had a class I was supposed to teach in January. I had to find another teacher. I still had a few more clients who had paid me. So I did their charts. And then in early December, after I had done the last chart, I decided to start reading the Bible. And I started reading it. A bit every day. I started with Matthew. And a few days before Christmas, I was in Matthew chapter 8. I was reading very, very slowly because I didn't really understand it. And as I was reading this account of Jesus with his disciples on the boat and the storm at sea and how he rebukes the sea and the wind, um, God opened my eyes. And I... I saw who Jesus really was for the first time. And I realized I had been on a wrong spiritual path my whole life and that I needed, the only way I could be reconciled to God was through Jesus Christ. And I just turned my life over to him at that moment. And I knew I was a new person. And that, that was December 21st, 1990. That's wonderful, Marsha. Yes, now some people should know that <laughs> that I was working part-time in an office. I was doing my astrology, or had been doing it before I gave it up. But my marriage had ended the year before. I had a son, um, you know, I needed to support. And one of my clients actually offered me a part-time job in his office. And what I was doing there was he was giving me the birth data on the employees, and then he would ask my advice based on their birth data. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, of course, nobody else in the office knew that. That was secret. Um, he and I were the only ones who knew that's why I was there. Well, in that office, there was a young Christian man. And I did let people know I was an astrologer. I didn't tell them that's what I was doing there. But I did let them know I was an astrologer. And so I found out in April... Um, of the following year that this young man had been praying for me with a group at his, a fellowship group at his church. And they had been praying all during that year. Wow. That's wonderful. And no wonder you felt that, that tug. Yes. That towards Jesus and that tug to give up the astrology. And, and I think some listeners might say, well, what's so, what's wrong with astrology? But, as the Bible shows, and particularly the Old Testament, the astrologers and those that practice astrology, um, it's a form of divination which basically mm -hmm. involves evil spirits. Whether the person sees the spirits or not, the, the powers are, are coming from these evil spirits. So, Marsha, when did you actually um, throw out your astrology books? Did you burn them? What did you do? Um, yeah, it, if go near them. So I had my books, um, and they were astrology, but also some other books, like books um, about Edgar Casey, and you know, books about past lives, and some of the books on the the Eastern religions. And they were all on a bookcase, uh, but I, I just was unable to go near the bookcase for um, about three weeks or so. I just couldn't go over there. I didn't know what to do, and I couldn't go near the bookcase, so I didn't. Then I finally decided I, I had to get rid of them. Now, at first, because I was so young in the faith, and I had no one to guide me, no one understood, no one at that church understood what had happened to me. And um, I, I gave or sold some of the books at the Astrological Society. I had quit the Astrological Society, but I went up there um, to a class, and I had asked the teacher if I could sell some of my books to the students, and she said yes. So I sold some. Um, 
but of course later on um i can't remember what i did with the other ones i i think i must have thrown them away I, the only ones i could sell were the astrology ones so i think i i eventually threw the other ones away but my memory on it is so fuzzy i don't I just don't recall. I know I got rid of a lot of things. I had several notebooks of all of the astrological charts I had done, which, of course, represented years and years of work. And I remember throwing those out. I remember looking at them and thinking, you know, I was really good at this, and this is a lot of work I did, but this is all wrong, wrong, and I threw them away. And I I have to say... Uh, some people may not understand this, but I did not understand at the time that astrology was evil. I just knew God didn't like it, and I knew he said it. It about a year and a half to understand that, well, really to understand what evil was and to understand that what I had been doing was not just wrong, but it was evil. That's just, it's just amazing the Holy Spirit was prompting you in that way. Um, we've only got some minutes left now, Marcia, so could, could you briefly say what you found the main changes in your life since you became a Christian? Yes, um, I think the, the biggest change is that I don't have that need to search I don't, I'm not always searching for some, um, you know, new teacher or something new out there in order to get some kind of information, some new form of, of divination or some new message from a new teacher. I don't feel that there's no need to search for the answer because the answer is Jesus Christ. And um, that is one of the biggest changes. The other one is is that that he is, you know, he is the anchor in my life. He is totally, um, totally unshakable. He's totally faithful. He's totally loving. And no matter what my failures and weaknesses are, when I depend on him, I have strength. I have strength from him. And I know over these years, you know, the other change I I can see that's been more gradual has been the change in my desires, the kinds of things that I have, that I used to enjoy or think were okay. I have no desire for them at all, and I have a desire for things that please the Lord. I mean, I'm still on that journey, of course, but I can see so many changes in my life just based on the things I used to like and that I no longer enjoy at all. And things I enjoy, I never in a million years would have thought I would have wanted, you know, to do them. So, um, you know, it's like reading the Bible. I love reading the Bible. I love studying the Bible. It's one of my, my main things that I love to do. And, of course, when I was in the New Age, I, I did have a Bible, and I would quote from it for my New Age. I, I was a writer also. I wrote for some New Age publications, and I would just pick out quotes, you know, and I would give them a New Age meaning and use them in my articles. But, um, of course, I didn't think the Bible was really God's Word. So, um, you know, my whole outlook, my whole worldview is completely different. That's wonderful. Amen. And Amen. Marcia, could you, could you um, advise Christians who are listening on how to reach out to those involved in any of the New Age activities you've mentioned? Yes, um, sure. I think that the first thing to do is remember that they are somebody made in the image of God And don't try to classify them, you know, as, oh, this is an astrologer, this is a spiritualist, this is a tarot card reader, this is a Wiccan. Remember that first first they are a person made in the image of God and ask God to give you the ability to see that person as he sees them and to give you a love, a love, give you the love of Jesus for this person and then ask them 
uh, uh, questions, questions about, about what, what they, they believe, believe and ask them, them um, what, what their, their background, background is. is. I, I always, always think that's very important, important uh, because if they say, well, I used to be a Christian or I used to go to church, I always want to ask them, well, why have you rejected that? Because when they say why they've rejected it, it usually gives you a really big understanding of usually it's a misconception of Christianity. It's usually maybe they were in a really bad church. They had really bad teachings. They never they never got the gospel. So I usually try to go in that direction and then explain, you know, uh, if they say, well, I just got, just got tired of following all those yeah. Not at all what it's about. That's not what Jesus taught. And I usually also try to find out who they think um, God is and who they think Jesus is. Uh, because people in these areas um, that you and I were in, Laura, usually believe in God and Jesus. They just don't have the right view. But they have some kind of God and some kind of Jesus. They're not. There are some Wiccan atheists. But most of the people, of course, um, in the other areas and and New Agers always have some kind of God or Jesus. So I try to find out what they think of of God and Jesus and who they think they are. And that's usually just a way to start talking to them. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. And I would agree agree with you there. Um, Just towards the end now of the interview, could you please tell listeners your website details and the title of your book, Spellbound? Yes, okay. My website is the name of my ministry, Christian Answers for the New Age. Org. Word. Christian Answers for the New Age. Org. And I have many, many articles on there about different New Age um, and occult topics. And um, I have a book called Spellbound The Paranormal Seduction of today's kids, uh, which is on, <clears throat> I haven't, I should have checked, um, it has been on Amazon UK, I don't know if it's still there, I, I think it probably is, and you probably would have to get it from um, marketplace sellers, and it's on Amazon here in the United States, and from secondhand sellers, because it came out in 06, um, but I do want to mention it is an ebook as well. So you can get it for Kindle and you, or for some kind of e-reader. Um, that should be pretty easy to find um, in a lot of places. And it's a book on um, occult, occult influences through the culture, through media, entertainment, especially those that target um, young people and children. Well, that's great, Marsha. And there's also some interviews of you on YouTube and there's one on yoga that I especially like that people could perhaps find those two. Just in closing now, Marsha, could you please pray for the listeners as you feel led? Yes, I will do that. I'd like to do that. Um, Dear Lord, we pray that everything said here today would be used by you for each of those listening. We pray for everyone listening, those who are Christians, we pray They would be bold in their witness, um, especially to people lost in the New Age and occult areas. Pray that they would desire to share the the light of Christ with people. And we pray for those who may be listening who don't know Christ, that you would draw them to Christ, that these words would be um, a way for them to see that uh, these practices in the occult are evil and will only put them in bondage and that the true freedom is in Jesus Christ and we pray that you would open their eyes to the truth and we pray in Jesus name Amen Amen. Well thank you so much Marsha for joining us today Thank you so much for having me on Laura I really enjoyed it I really enjoyed having you Well, everybody, I hope you were really encouraged by tonight's testimony and what Marcia had to share. Please tune in again next time for another testimony. God bless you and goodbye. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio.
preceding program was made possible by kind donations from the listeners to Eternal Radio, for which we are very grateful.